I just want to welcome Dr. Burrup and Dr. Rice, and then of course, Superintendent Australia Henderson. Thank you so much for being here today. So we really appreciate it. I'm Dr. Lisa Norton. So I'm the Dean over the College of Education and Health Sciences. So I'm going to do a quick welcome. All right. And for those folks that are coming in the audience here, we'll officially begin in about a minute or so. I see folks are coming in. Um, And Mike, you just let me know when you're ready. I will. I'll cue you up. Sorry, I have a whining dog. <laughs> oh, no worries. Oh, what do you have? Oh, she's moving him apparently now. Uh, I can't remember what it is. She's told me in the past. Um, I know our provost often says that's one of the nicest things about the sort of one of the silver linings of the pandemic is we've got to see everyone else's pets and children and stuff like that and it's really allowed us to sort of get to know our colleagues better well uh so we we have some friends down the street and they got a cat uh, at the start of the pandemic and they named her kovi for for covid i love <laughs> it was cute. yeah i wonder how many babies born during the pandemic will be named covid <laughs> right right at least as a middle name <laughs> Right. That's a little sad. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Corona, yeah. Uh, sorry, Ray. Let me double check. I thought it was on. Um, It should be on there now, Ray, if you could confirm that's the case for me. Yeah, I see that too. I see oh, it. I perfect. See it. Thank you for that reminder, Ray. I knew I had done it in the system, um, but I'm glad you did the reminder there now so that we have it. Um, so we've hit the top of the hour and I want to be cognizant of folks' time. I know folks are still filing in, but uh, welcome to our webinar this afternoon. I'm going to uh, turn it over to our Dean of the College of Education and Health Sciences, Lisa May Norton, uh, to uh, welcome us here. Yeah, so I just want to take a moment to welcome um, all of our guests that are joining us today to learn about this important topic. And I most especially want to thank and welcome our um, our experts that are here with us today, our national and international experts, um, Dr. Mary Rice from the University of New Mexico and Dr. Jarrett Borup from George Mason University. I know you all have a lot of expertise in, the, in this field and probably been very busy the last uh, 18 months to 20 months. And I especially want to welcome our county superintendent, um, Australia Henderson. Um, thank you so much for being a partner with Toro throughout the years. And I know that you've been on other panels before, like our Latina Leaders panel. Um, and I just want to thank all our school district partners um, in general around the Bay Area who we work in tandem with both pre and post COVID-19 and coalition and collaboration as we've all kind of grappled with, you know, this new world together. Um, and I'm excited. I'm actually really excited for this discussion of what we've learned during this time, how we approach the current right now and then the future as we kind of move um, into, again, this new world. Um, I think anchor institutions such as universities and healthcare must work in tandem with our school partners to create safe and invigorating learning environments for all ALL capital of our children. And I know here in Solano County, um, our county superintendents and our local superintendents have worked really, really hard to create those opportunities. So I just wanna thank everyone for being here and having the opportunity for us to learn more. And hopefully this will be informative for those that are on about how we move into this new stage um, of, of the, the COVID experience. So with that said, Mike, I'm gonna hand it, excuse me, Dr. Barber, I'm going to hand it back over to you. And I'm looking very much forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dean Norton. So to begin, I wanna say that uh, Torrey University of California, uh, which is located on beautiful Mare Island, uh, is the home to, or sorry, um, I want to acknowledge that it sits on the unceded land that was part of the 1851-1852 unratified treaties. Uh, specifically, it sits on track 296 
uh, which was part of Treaty O. Um, the land that we uh, occupy was the traditional home of the Karkin people, who were one of the eight Ohlone tribes in the Bay Area. And then Solano County was also home to the Patwan and Miwok people as well. Um, consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Toro is working towards building relationships with our indigenous communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Um, now, before I begin and introduce the, the panel, I want to set the stage a little bit. So if you think about the way in which the last 18 months have rolled out, the educational response to the pandemic has really sort of followed these four phases. Uh, the first phase was essentially what happened immediately in March, early April of 2020, when we all made a rapid transition to remote learning. Um, as folks became more familiar and, and comfortable in that environment, individual teachers, as well as full schools and districts, transitioned into phase two, where they started doing things that were consistent with skills that they already had. Uh, phase three represents a period of time where we're bouncing back and forth between in-person, hybrid, and fully remote learning, which was most of the last school year. And then phase four is really what education is going to look like once the pandemic is completed and we're settling into this new normal. Now, it's important to remember sort of where we are. And I know we've gotten rid of the tier system here in California, uh, but the Mercury News actually produced a chart about, um, I guess, three weeks ago now that essentially coded each of the counties based upon where they would have fallen at the time on the old tier system. And if you look at the counties in the Bay Area, we see a lot of red and purple, in particular Solano County would have actually fallen into the purple category. And if you look at the track, so the red line there is where we've gone since the 19th of July. So since that map was produced. So as you see, the trend line is not heading in uh, a positive direction. And um, for those of you that have forgotten, you know, what we had when we were in these different tiers, uh, these were the restrictions that were in place when we looked at what was included uh, in the purple tier. And if you look down near the bottom, um, you know, it basically says that schools would have been in a remote context if they were open right now based upon uh, those tiers. So um, turning it over to the panel here now, and, and before I introduce uh, our three folks, um, I want to acknowledge the fact that um, if you have questions of a medical nature or those that are more focused upon the vaccine, um, we have Dr. Tammy Hendricks, who is our uh, newly appointed uh, Dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine available. And immediately following this session, so as soon as we conclude at four o'clock, she's going to be available to answer any of those questions that you might have. And we're happy to stick around for as long as you need. Uh, to address those issues. Uh, so on our panel today, uh, we've got two colleagues of mine, uh, Jared Borup and Mary Rice. Uh, Jared is someone who I've known for a long time from the time he was a doc student uh, onwards and uh, probably best known within our field for being the only person that's actually come up with a theoretical framework that's specific to K-12 students in a remote environment. Um, I've known of Mary since she was a doc student, although I've only gotten to know her uh, since she became a faculty member in New Mexico. Um, and uh, her work has largely focused, at least in the K-12 online learning environment, uh, looking at how we serve students with disabilities in special education, which is a, an area that so often gets overlooked in our field. Uh, moderating today's discussion, so she's going to be the one asking the questions uh, of folks and, and fielding the questions that might come through the chat or the Q&A. Um, Lisette is someone who I've actually only had a chance to meet this uh, week. Um, although I did ask my, my director of the GSOE, um, the Graduate School of Education, you know, if she knew her and what she could tell me about her. And let me tell you, she can sing her praises. I noticed her bio talks about her 36 years in education. And uh, if I were to listen to our director, uh, she's got something good to say about all 36 of those years. So um, with that, I will uh, stop sharing here now. And uh, actually, I'm going to go off video as well. And I will turn it over to our able moderator along with our panelists. Thank you so much, Dr. Barber. I wanna take the time to thank all of the individuals at Toro University for making this panel possible. I know that uh, everyone is anxious to get back into school 
uh, to in-person learning, recognizing that there are a lot of lessons to be learned from what we have just gone through over the last 18 months. And how do we continue to move forward in a positive way, recognizing that this has been very difficult for everyone all the way around, whether it be our educators, our parents, um, our entire community. And uh, this is really an opportunity that I'm so grateful that Toro has taken to help us think about how those lessons learned and how we move forward in a positive direction, knowing that there are still, they still remain many unknowns as we open our schools. So thank you again to, uh, to Dr. Barber and Dean Norton and the entire colleagues at Toro University for making this panel possible for our educators, not only in Solano County, but also across the region. So I do have a couple of questions for Dr. Burrup and Dr. Rice. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that you're experts in your field and uh, we're anxiously awaiting to hear uh, your thoughts and your perspectives from lessons learned. Yeah, it's uh, great to be here. Thanks. Uh... Uh, for the invitation and uh, Michael for the um, introduction. Yes. So this question is for both Dr. Rice and Dr. Barrett. Certainly after over a year of interrupted learning imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic, more students than ever are experiencing learning gaps. Remote and hybrid learning have increased the demands placed on educators families and students during the learning process. In fact, just one of many studies estimates that the students will have experienced over four and a half months of interrupted learning on average compared to typical in-class learning. So for both Dr. Rice and Dr. Burrup, based on your experience, what do you think we ought to be focusing on to improve student outcomes and accelerated learning in our systems moving forward based on lessons learned. Mary, do you wanna start? <laughs> yeah, I'll go ahead and start. So um, first I think that it's important to um, really get some strong ideas around just the whole idea of learning gaps and learning losses and, and things like that. And sometimes we shorthand it those way in those ways um, but what we're, we're really talking about is that schools have a list often right a curriculum is what they call it of things that kids are supposed to learn at certain grades or certain times of the year and what is suggested by the, so the learning loss discourse is that if they weren't there when that was happening then they didn't get the opportunity to learn it or, or at least display they learned it in you know, traditional school-based systems. And therefore, you know, in some ways that has to be made up. And so what I think is really important to remember is that that is a construct, <laughs> that, um, you know, that list was generated by people. If people wanted in states and to some degree, then the national board of governors, and if they wanna change those things or revisit those things, then there's not, there, those are not in Libriate. So they absolutely can change according to what needs to happen. And then the other thing is also taking into account, well, kids weren't getting, you know, this, the list of stuff and they weren't able to prove it in the traditional ways, but that doesn't mean families weren't doing anything during the pandemic too. So there was lots of really interesting things I saw, like um, when mom was having her, her children help her with the grocery list, right? Because you've got a grocery tighter during the pandemic with food shortages, but then these kids were all using their devices and they were trying to use different list programs, <laughs> figure out what one worked the best. And that is brilliant in a number of ways. One, it achieves this really practical end. Two, it helps them learn how to choose from among different digital tools to do a specific task, which is good digital literacy. And then um, also the kids inputting then gives like typing experience or telling Siri or um, Alexa or whoever what to order, right? So all of that kind of stuff. And so we haven't really taken stock very well of what students were doing 
and what may actually be useful and how we can leverage those things. Um, so that's what I'll say at the beginning. And then if Jared wants to say something and then I can come back around if you like. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Dr. Barrett? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I taught uh, ninth grade social studies and it's hard teaching in just a normal environment, right? And so you can imagine what a challenge this year has been uh, for teachers. Uh, one analogy I give is that um, we kind of prepared as, as a teacher prepares, you know, um, or teacher educators, we, we prepared them to play the guitar. And then one night we said, here's a banjo and you have a concert tomorrow. <laughs> you know? And, and, you know, they, they really thrived during this time. Um, but at the same time, we, we need to focus on what they're able to do. There are certainly some gaps uh, and some large gaps, um, depending on a lot of different factors, right? Depending on the student characteristics, uh, their home characteristics, uh, the teacher's ability to teach in this environment, right? Um, so, so certainly there are gonna be learning gaps, but I, I think um, as educators, uh, we know that differentiation is important. Um, it's always been a challenge to do that. It's certainly easier to uh, uh, kind of do chalk talk or say and spray or whatever, or, or what is it, uh, say, spray and pray that they, <laughs> they, they get it. Um, so I, I think that uh, we need to move to new modes of instruction that really meet students where they are. Um, and if we're not able to do that, then it's just gonna get compounded each year these learning gaps. But if we're able to really see where students are, uh, be able to differentiate our instruction, um, then we can start closing those gaps. And, and I think that uh, we might be able to close them faster than we think. Um, but at the same time, uh, that isn't the way we've always done it. And so teachers really need support on how to teach in those new ways. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Burrup. My next question is uh, for Dr. Rice. We know that reading substantially impacts every aspect of our lives. And for our students, every aspect of their academic achievement. The data point to a relationship between the command of foundational skills and success in all other aspects of learning and life. And I'm wondering what would be your playbook and recommendations, practical recommendations that can be easily implemented for educators, in particular administrators and classroom teachers moving forward. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad that you asked that question because one thing I wanted to talk about was the fact that a lot of students get, didn't get access to um, wide variety of text in the same way. So during the pandemic and even uh, well, they couldn't go to the library, right? So your weekly trip to the school library in elementary school, that was out. <laughs> and your city library was closed too. And there were Audible and places like that were offering like free audio subscriptions, um, but families had different levels of access and just like part being part of their routine and interest in it. And so there really is, uh, there really was a shortage of students been able to engage with stories and sort of longer texts. So people watched a lot of TikTok videos. I know I did, <laughs> but, but like the kind of um, idea dense text that is really important for students to engage with in schools, for the most part, that wasn't happening. And I think then going back and considering those issues. So one thing is that libraries need to open back up with, with a vengeance when they're able to and do what they need to do to get people back in. So some one of those things might be cancel the late fees, <laughs> right? So all that does is make people scared to go in the library. And there's big libraries that are starting to do that, like the Salt Lake City County Library. And I'm sure some ones in California too, but whatever we have to do to invite people to come back in and, and get, Get the books. So um, showing people the range of audiobooks, I think is important too. Like Mo Willem reads all his great elephant and piggy books on, on uh, 
YouTube and I'm, I'm not a little kid, but I think they're a riot. And so like expanding all of those things for kids, I think is going to be really important. Um, another thing is that giving students time to read is really important, but if they can't, don't have something they want to read and they can't make sense of it, then that time's really wasted. And so I'm actually not in favor of spending long time, long periods of school time saying, well, everybody just read <laughs> because they're not going to be able to do that. What is most helpful actually is a model where students have the opportunity to receive instruction about reading and then they rotate through other kinds of skills like word work and things like that, even adolescents, even in the upper grades and working with conceptual ideas, um, planning out stuff, having good conversations, making inferences and, um, and moving forward from there. So, because what we do know about, about reading is that there's, um, there's that wide topic knowledge is really important. <laughs> so listening to the news and um, you know, getting exposure to lots of different types of text and it's very malleable, meaning that you can change it with practice. And um, working memory is also really important for early literacy for decoding. That's not very malleable. There's not, <laughs> there's not very much intervention we can do there. And so that's why that wide topic knowledge and that ability to talk and use oral language is incredibly important. And teachers need to do lots of that. And I hope that that doesn't get lost in the like fill the gap conversation where we teachers feel like that means we need to work through a workbook really fast. Instead, if we really want to make a difference, this is going to be about lively conversation and talking about topics, and looking up stuff that we're interested in and, um, you know, planning greater access to sophisticated language and sophisticated text. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Uh, so many important considerations uh, for educators moving forward and frankly, just really practical and easily implementable things uh, that we can do. And uh, I also want to point out that in Solano County, the fines have been dropped, uh, our Solano County library system. So thank you to the Solano County library system for being so forward thinking in that. Dr. Burrup, uh, this next question is for you. We recognize that the power of technology uh, can provide educators and learners access to information and opportunities exponentially every day, including benefits of enhanced supports for teachers, enhanced learning and engagement for students, and more supportive and equitable learning uh, cultures in schools and districts. It is also clear that technology will continue to play a central role in nearly all aspects of our lives over the coming years. Therefore, preparing students for career and life means in some part exposing them to meaningful technology while at school, critically, critically important. So this is a, a little bit of a, a tiered question, but moving forward based on lessons learned, what will be some important considerations for educators when it comes to rethinking the use of technology in schools? How can we best harness and leverage the power of technology as schools continue to navigate the changing conditions of the pandemic? And connected to the closing of the learning gaps that you mentioned in your previous response, what are some realistic, tangible strategies for closing those learning gaps that uh, you mentioned we could close more quickly than we think we can? Yeah, that, that's a that's a lot, uh, but but I, I do think that um, in general, if you ask teachers, you know, what what do you need? They're uh, with technology, they're going to pick technologies that will make what they're currently doing a little bit easier or a little bit more efficient, right? And we, so we, we see that all the time uh, where we're taking technology and essentially we're digitizing what we've, what we've always done. Um, and we saw that during the pandemic as well uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, when schools shut down, we opened our web browsers to Zoom or to Google Hangout and things like that. 
And we tried to replicate what we were doing in the in-person environment online. And we quickly found that that is really difficult to do and frustrating for teachers and for students and for parents. Um, but I, I think a better approach is rather than, than simply trying to digitize what we've always done or make things a little bit easier with technology, we can really consider um, what are the possibilities with technology and maybe the, the affordances uh, or you know, the possibilities that are not available to us without technology. Um, and so if we can see that and, and kind of harness that, um, then, then we're gonna be better off. I, I think that we also need to recognize that some things are best done without technology, right? And uh, I've been to several parent events um, before the pandemic, uh, because the district here was moving one-to-one -one and, and I felt like a lot of the parents were really concerned because they felt like their students were gonna be on laptops all day. And that is not the goal of, of, of technology. We certainly want access to technology, but at the same time, we need to understand when to use it and sometimes more importantly, when not to use it. Um, so so I, I think that, um, Currently, we're using technology to kind of transmit information, right, or, or to provide access to the teacher or access to peers and things like that. Um, I think that uh, eventually what we'll see is we'll move away from simply providing access to actually enabling new types of learning. Um, and actually, I, I think some of the best uses of technology is when students are using the technology themselves and taking some control over their learning and actually demonstrating their understanding or learning in new ways that would be difficult otherwise. So, so as far as some um, practical things to consider, uh, there's a really great um, article that I like. It's a framework. Uh, it's called the, the PICRAP model. But I'm going to put that in the in the chat, and I need to do it for everyone, not just the hosts and panelists. Just a minute, okay? So this is some researchers by Royce Kimmins and his colleagues at Brigham Young University, um, and they have a, a model that they use where they basically say, um, is the use of technology passive? Is it interactive, or is it creative? Right? And I think that oftentimes we use technology and it's passive. We ask students to listen to a lecture. We ask uh, students to, you know, listen to a podcast or watch a video or, you know, even read an article or something like that, right? It's, it's, it tends to be passive. They don't have a lot of control over what they're doing. But then you can also move from passive to interactive where they're actually maybe have some control. Maybe they're using a, an adaptive learning software or maybe they're doing internet searches. They, they have some control of what is going on um, in their learning. And then at the, the higher level is that it's creative. They're actually you know, creating something uh, that didn't exist before using technology. And, and all three of those are really great and helpful, but I think that sometimes we're out of balance and, and, and learning is a bit too passive. Uh, so, so I feel like um, that's a helpful model. And the other part of that, so that, that was the PIC. The other part is the RAT, the RAT. And that is, are we using technology to replace what we've always done? Like I said, to digitize what we've, what we've always done or to amplify it, make it a little bit better, but it's still kind of the same thing. Or are we using technology to really transform learning activities? Um, so I think that's a helpful model. And I also think um, one great powerful use of technology is to allow students to have choice, you know? Uh, we hear personalized learning a lot. Um, and sometimes we think, oh, well, that's the technology adapting to the student behavior, or, you know, uh, we think of um, these adaptive learning software and things like that. That, that can be part of it, but, but I actually think that the, 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 the greatest use of personalized learning is when we allow students and guide students in, in their own decision-making with their education. Um, Very powerful, Dr. Jarab. Very, very powerful, thank you. Um, this next question is for both Dr. Rice and Dr. Burup, and maybe Dr. Rice can, uh, can start. 
as we recover from this public health and education emergency, and we know that we're right in the thick of it right now, what should we as educators from kindergarten, pre-K, TK, preschool, all the way up to institutes of higher education, what should we be focusing on as we work toward building an education system that places equity at the center? Well, the, I'm gonna answer about along the lines of accessibility first. So um, Ray Rose put that in the chat to, to make sure that we talk about that. And I think that that is, um, is an important thing to consider initially. So I have a, I'm gonna share my screen. I have a checklist that um, I've been sharing with teachers and working with them on accessibility in sort of three general categories. The like generally accessible information and then the linguistic material, uh, the oral and written and then the visual material thinking about whether or not the students can really access it just from a technical perspective. So assuming they can get on the internet, assuming that their device is in, con in good condition, which wasn't true <laughs> for a lot of the students. So there was one district I worked with where they ordered, um, you know, like a thousand Chromebooks and then 700 charge cords, and that's just not going to work. <laughs> so we've got to order more. Um, but assuming that all those things come together and that the curriculum is, is online, the instructional materials are of reasonable quality. Otherwise, then accessibility is a big, is a big thing. And a lot of stuff that's created for the internet just is not accessible from, um, a, from a section 508 sort of technical kind of perspective. And um, it's helpful for teachers because they, a lot of times they haven't even thought about it. So for instance, if I took, here I am screen capturing. So I'm up here and I'm gonna take a screenshot of this and I take this thing right here and then I put it into my PowerPoint, a screen reader won't read this even though it's got text on it. So if I want the screen reader to be able to read it, then I have to, and I wanna put it on my PowerPoint, then I have to copy it like that. And, um, and so and just showing teachers stuff like that, that's very practical, it's actually very easy. Another thing that is very important is if you're gonna use Zoom, so use the captioning or you know whatever kind of platform you're operating off of and advocate for those things. So. Uh, Michael actually, Dr. Barber directed me to the attention of a lot of schools who were really having trouble with students who had visual impairments, like getting them online and getting them access because they went and chose a learning management system that wasn't accessible. And, and so then they were like, well, what's the workaround? Well, it's actually really difficult <laughs> to do workarounds. So the best that, you know, that we could come up with is that you need to go put that stuff into, into Google Spaces. And it's not like I don't, I'm not aware of the, all the things around Google, right? And them capturing our personal information and data and whatnot, but it is pretty accessible, like a lot of it. And so then somebody has to move it out of the learning management system and into the Google stuff. And if they'd asked those questions at the outset, if the first question they'd asked before you get any kind of instructional material is, is this accessible, then a lot of, a lot of heartache <laughs> could have been avoided. Um, you know, and again, going back to audiobooks, there were a lot of books that were made, you know, um, that were audio supported that were online, but not all of them were. And it's important to, as teachers, to really push for that. Um, the problem is, is that teachers often don't get asked. So what technologies would you like? You know, what would you like to use? And certainly students and parents don't. So, but even teachers sometimes are left out of the loop. They're just told, well, we bought this thing <laughs> and, and now we would really like you to use it. And sometimes even we're gonna supervise you and make sure that you use it in, you know, these particular ways. Yeah, or log the time that students are in the system. Yeah, all that. Yeah. And so I think that accessibility piece is also important. And then also from a, from a real strong equity perspective, um, urgency is the tool of white supremacy. It's having to make a decision quick. 
and having to decide and, and it being in a very narrow range of people's hands, that's how we get inequitable outcomes. Uh, if you go read Kendi's work and some people like that, then they flip it. They say it's not that we have hate and then we have um, and, and then we have like re, not that we have bad outcomes and then we have racist policies and, you know, and then we have all of all of this confusion. It often starts with somebody makes a policy that they don't think through all the way and they do it because they got to do it quick and they don't involve a lot of other people. And so if we start with a policy and we think of really carefully about who is likely to be vulnerable and hurt by this first, then we're gonna make better decisions. We're gonna involve the people that would need to be involved. And then we won't get hugely inequitable outcomes, but schools are places that foster urgency. <laughs> it's like, it's just what happens and changing that culture, I think is gonna be really tough, but it's also perfectly doable. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Certainly, we have the opportunity to move forward and lead forward in a positive direction, given the lessons learned and given the sense of urgency that, frankly, we still find ourselves in. And uh, so you provide really good perspective uh, in that arena. Uh, Dr. Burrup, uh, from your perspective, uh, what can you add in terms of building toward an education system that places equity at the center. Certainly, uh, Dr. Rice addressed the issue of accessibility so critically important. Um, from your perspective. So one, one thing I would just highlight is um, having access, uh, you know, is, is, is really critical. We have to start there. But at the same time, we need to consider how is that technology being used, but also what are the supports that students have at home? Um, so oftentimes we, we say, well, I'm, I'm treating all my students the same, I'm giving all of them the same opportunities, but, but what we don't understand or think about is that their home support systems are dramatically different. And so you might um, be a, a, an advanced placement teacher and, and you have students do a lot of work from home and, you know, you, you uh, get all these amazing projects back. And, and what you notice is that a lot of the parents are actively supporting their students and sometimes overly so, <laughs> you know, um, I've, I've interviewed uh, one teacher that in an online program that basically said, oh, well, I, I do all his busy work so we can focus on the important stuff. And I thought, oh, that's not, <laughs> that's not the purpose of, of discussion board activities and things like that, right? Like there's a lot of ethical concerns about that. But, but I, I also think that there are emerging models that are really powerful that can help uh, students be successful even when they don't have a lot of support at home. So for instance, I was doing some work with uh, Michigan Virtual Learning Research Institute and um, and we just had a question of uh, what, what brick and mortar schools were the most successful with their online students. And so we sampled uh, those um, schools and then we asked uh, administrators and uh, facilitators there what they were doing. And one thing that we found is that um, there was a very, very active in-person facilitator supporting students in their online courses to the point where they were actually taking their online courses in, in a daily classroom environment, you know, with an adult there that was really encouraging them, supporting them. And then we, we said, well, I wonder uh, what type of supports they were getting from home. And we reached out to parents. And one thing we found is that some parents didn't even know their students were in an online class. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, they, it, it, it almost uh, made it so that their support had to be the same, um, where typically parents need to be more actively supporting students in an online course. If you have these facilitators, they kind of level the playing field for, for a lot of these um, for a lot of these students. And I, and I think we need to be really creative in how we provide support systems for students. Some of these facilitators we talked to, they, didn't, they were not teachers. Uh, in fact, one only had a high school diploma. She had no um, college experience at all, but she was a parent. She knew how to develop relationships with students and to really encourage them. Um, and, 
and she was absolutely amazing. Um, but from a school district perspective, it was a steal to have her because they were paying her close to minimum wage, you know, but, but I, I think that, um, we need to consider, you know, budgetary constraints and things like that, but there are opportunities to just bring in more support for, for, for all students, but especially for those students that perhaps lack it at home. Thank you. You really pointed to some very practical uh, approaches to focusing on equity as we move forward. I'm very interested in, for both of you, how do you think the pandemic will impact a shift in educational paradigms in years to come? In other words, the work of schooling, teaching and learning, how do you think the pandemic will impact these paradigms moving forward? Well, I think we can already see one of the effects and that's that uh, parents are becoming more interested in what the curriculum is and for good or for bad, right? For like some ways that may be easier and some ways that's gonna cause tension. So such as those, um, you know, the parents storming the school and saying you can't teach critical race theory when teachers certainly aren't prepared to teach it anyway. So <laughs> maybe some things about social justice and anti-racism, but certainly not CRT, right? And so, because they, uh, teachers are struggling right now just to learn how to use different technology supports, right? So, but we're seeing, I really think that there's a link between being able to have that kind of exposure in a broad sense to what the students are doing and actually having to sit through and do the, do the busy work as a parent. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, I wanna see in this in ways in which, you know, like schools have got to make those decisions before. And remember I said at the beginning, it's, it's a socially constructed list. There's no reason why the list can't change. And there's no reason why it can't change in, in really positive ways to think about instead of trying to make everybody the same with the same kinds of knowledge and the same kinds of skills across the board, it's well, what matters to people, right? In their individual communities and things like that. So I think that, I think that we're just getting to the top of the roller coaster and it's about to go down really fast on um, parent input in things like in, in things like curriculum. I think an, um, one thing that a lot of teachers have told me is that they actually didn't mind remote online teaching as much when they got to go to their school to do it because all their stuff was there. <laughs> so their resources were there. And, they, and one teacher told me, hey, I, 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 I sat down in my classroom and even though the students were like away from me, um, I felt like a teacher, you know, in this particular kind of space. And so I think um, that teachers, some teachers found out they really liked online learning and some students found out they really liked online learning and some types of students with some types of disabilities um, can benefit quite greatly from the various affordances of online learning. And I think people, we thought we had school choice before, but I think that movement is really gonna blossom in new ways and so those are those are two things that I'm seeing. And then I guess from a from a special education perspective too, um, there I saw a real sense of um, of just sort of waiting out the pandemic in some cases, like oh I do we don't need to change that support or we don't need to rewrite that IEP because you know two weeks to flatten the curve. <laughs> but I really think it's a change I'd like to see is for schools to like get in the now. And if that means for things like IEPs that we have to say, okay, we get to put our imaginations on and say, all right, well, if we have to move to remote learning, what are the supports needed? If we have to um, be concurrent, which a lot of teachers hope they never have to do again ever, what, what are the supports that are needed? If we are gonna do blended instruction that is largely in the classroom, what supports are needed? And if we are gonna do fully in-person learning, what supports are needed and just make, do that planning so that we don't have to make those quick decisions, right? It's very exciting, yeah. Dr. Rice, to hear you speak of the opportunity to reimagine what teaching and learning looks like and those options 
uh, that we may not have previously thought of before uh, in years to come. Uh, how going through the pandemic, as difficult as it has been, is really to look at it as an opportunity for reimagining the possibilities. Yeah. Dr. Burrup, your thoughts. Yeah, so uh, I was actually thinking, you know, the cat lawyer meme uh, that, that kind of went viral and uh, he couldn't take off his filter and he was a cat and it's, a, you know, there's a judge and lawyer there. And and uh, the, the saying that he had that went viral was, I, I'm not a cat. Um, but right after that, he said, um, I'm prepared to go forward with it. You know, and then I feel like that's kind of been the motto of so many teachers uh, during the last 18 months. They didn't quite know what to do, but they were prepared to go forward with it. And they really thrived when they were able to do that, when they were able to, to get over the, the fear of making a mistake or things like that. Uh, they really thrived. Like I saw instruction that just blew me away. Um, during the pandemic uh, that I'd never seen before. Um, and I've been looking at online teaching for a long time and, and it was really inspirational for me. And, and I feel like um, once teachers can get over that fear and being able to try something new, um, they, they can do a lot of things. And so I'm hoping that, that we've kind of worked that out of our system you know, uh, during the pandemic and that we're gonna come back to class willing to take risk, willing to do something new. Um, I, I think one thing that we really learned is that it's hard to hold students' attention um, online when there's a browser tab away from anything you can imagine. Uh, and so they, they I, I think that teachers made things more interactive or tried to make things more interactive. Um, and some were more successful than others, but I think that uh, some of the most powerful activities that I saw it really brought students together in breakout rooms or they were, you know, working collaboratively to complete something um, and create something new. Um, and I'm really hoping that after this 18 months of professional learning uh, that we've had, forced professional learning on us, um, we are we're going to be ready uh, to, to kind of bring some of that back into the classroom. Um, I, I'm also kind of curious for the attendees. Uh, I, I'm assuming we have some teachers here. I, uh, we can go on to another question, but I'm really curious, what have been your bi biggest successes? If you guys can put that in the chat. Um, what do you think you'll be bringing to the classroom? I'm, I'm al I always ask that when I do uh, these webinars and I always love the answers, so. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Burrup. Shifting to uh, our parents, and both of you have um, referred to the different ways in which parents are viewing their child's education. Do you think that the pandemic has prompted a shift in the way parents participate in their child's education? And if so, what do you believe that shift to be? And do you believe it'll be short-term, long-term? How do you think the pandemic has impacted the shift in how parents see themselves in their child's education? Either one of you. Um, yeah, so uh, the parents that I talked to and being one myself, I, I think that uh, they're really looking forward to starting the fall where they don't have to be as involved. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're ready to take a step back. They're exhausted. They've been managing so much during this pandemic as well. I, I remember when my daughter was on a zoom call, sometimes we'd see, you know, parents in the background trying to, you know, in their own zoom calls or things like that. And when their kids were struggling and, you know, it's, it's just been really hard. And I think that all, all parents have reached to a point where, where they've been frustrated and kind of breaking down and uh, during, during this pandemic. Um, but I also think that what we've learned is as parents that we, we are becoming more technological as well, right? Um, how many of us were really proficient in Zoom 18 months ago? And so you can see where I really hope that we can continue leveraging uh, this access uh, online where you know, having parent meetings, 
hopefully will be super easy now, right? Like, like we can do that um, super easily. Uh, guest speakers, you know, volunteers. I, I think I think that uh, while parents will be taking a step back, and rightfully so, um, there there's also we can increase the quality of of their participation. We can make things more efficient, but we can also make things better when when we reach out to parents and ask them to to be involved. And and I do think that parents want to be more involved, you know, in in ways that. Um, uh, they feel confident in, in doing. And I think that uh, we're going to see more of that. I mean, imagine, uh, so, so you'd always have like room parents and things like that. Why couldn't you have like a station where there are room parents ready to help you and to read with you and, and things like that online, right? Like, I think you can get a lot of this um, uh, through, through technology, but also kind of blending that with the in-person support that, that we're hoping for as well. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your perspective, Dr. Barep. Dr. Rice, thoughts? Yeah, I will remember I mostly work with, with parents of students with disabilities. And so they got hit quite a bit harder on <laughs> some of these things um, during the pandemic. So like, um, like I remember working with one family where they've got two, two, two well, it's a single mother and she's got two children with disabilities and she is a essential worker. And so she's got to go to work every day. And then what of that, right? So how are you going to put the appropriate supports in place and, and things like that. And so, um, like I said, what's going to be really important for me is that schools go back and say, okay, what do we need to put in place in order to help? the most vulnerable families when we are going online. And for the most part, states that had pandemic plans, had pandemic plans around sort of the health sorts of related things and then maybe device distribution, um, but they didn't plan for long-term online learning. So it was like a snow day or, you know, maybe that maybe a week or two of online learning for some reason, but they never thought about this protracted prolonged thing and that they're going to have to have plans in place to help families, um, you know, survive, <laughs> make it through this. And, um, and in terms of parent involvement, so I'm a parent too, and I'm the parent that leaves my house at one end of the street. And as I walk my daughter to school, other kids come out. And I, and I thought, well, isn't this interesting? We're all going to school at the same time. And then um, one of my neighbors said, yeah, I see you walk by. And then I send her because I know you're watching her. And <laughs> so it's like the, in, so they were my little ducks, right? So I'm, what I'm really doing is I'm mama ducking, you know, huge numbers of children in the neighborhood to school in the morning. And when the pandemic started, the students were all supposed to go get online. And one of the kids were trying to message each other on Google Meet, like, I can't get in the meet, where's my teacher? And so then, um, and I was able to like, give them the passcode and get everybody online. And it was the same thing. <laughs> That's what I was doing is I was mama ducking all those kids into the meet, you know, um, so that they could get the places that they needed to go. And so I think that um, hopefully the, a commitment to other people's children will also emerge. So as long as we're, we've got a wish list, right? As long as we're reimagining, because I think that's always been the most important thing to me about democratic participation in public school is that it's not just about what's good for my kid. It's about what's good for all the kids to the best, to the very best that we can do. And that when you just come down and advocate for your own, it's not going to work, right? And I'm in a position where I'm a parent. And so I, you know, and I really love my daughter and I want to, make sure that she does well. But I also, you know, I have a lot of interest in what happens to other people's children at my school and in my district and in the community. And so, and I hope that it gave people more opportunity or that we'll plan for people to have more opportunity to care about everyone. I love that idea. And, and I was just thinking on our street, we met parents that I didn't know before you know, the <laughs> pandemic, it just feels like uh, we've come closer together as a community. Uh, ironically, you know, with social distancing and everything, but lots of street conversations and corner conversations. And so, so yeah, I love that idea, Mary. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Thank you both so much for your perspectives. You know, one last question. Um, there has been some, uh, some comments in the chat about reconnecting with students and re-engaging students. And as our closing question, I would love to get your thoughts and perspectives on just some practical ways that uh, we can help educators think about how do we re-engage with students successfully as we go into this next coming school year based on lessons learned. That's great. I, I can start with this one, Mary. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I've talked with uh, online teachers and they say, I I'm able to form closer relationships with my online students than I can in person, right? And I think because online you focus on the one and sometimes in person, that's hard to do. And, and so I think with, with blended learning, as we move in that direction, the power of blended learning is not the technology. It's able to leverage the technology so that the teacher has the data that they need to meet students where they are and work with them individually or in small groups. That's really the goal of, uh, of blended learning and personalized learning. And I think that as we do that, we're gonna continue to build on those relationships um, and extend on them. The other thing that I hear a lot is when teachers provide students with choice in how they're demonstrating their learning, it's amazing what they create and what you learn about those students. Um, they create things where if you try to make it mandatory across all students, 90% of your students would hate you, you know, uh, but that, but it's not for 90% of the students, it's for that one student where you give them choice. Um, and one of the most impactful things on learning is actually getting feedback from students and applying that feedback. And so hopefully we see more of that moving forward as well. Wonderful. As we wrap it up, uh, Dr. Rice, some final thoughts? Yeah, I think, I think we're in for quite a, quite a few wonderful things. So uh, one thing I saw on NPR that was really interesting is um, it's called the pandemic survival kit. And the teacher asked the students to put, take visual images of stuff that was helping them survive the pandemic. And it was re really a great get to know you, you know, kind of relational thing. So a lot of teachers who were teaching online and they said, oh yeah, these relationships are possible. And sometimes they're even stronger. So, um, so I don't think that we have to necessarily think that that is going to be a problem, but, um, in psychology, what I learned, what I've learned is, um, is reach out comfort in. And I think that that is really important to think about as we do the social emotional work in the pandemic and that you who the students are regarded to be at the center, right. Of this crisis, if you're the teacher, because of the power differential and they are going to reach to you and you're going to provide support to them, but, and they're not going to provide it back in most cases. So like they do cute things and you love them, but they're not, they're not providing support to you. And so it's important as a teacher that you figure out who you're reaching out to so that you don't feel like people are just coming and plucking the fruit off your tree until you haven't got anything left, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we didn't get clear enough, you know, we didn't have time, right? And the things were, the world was crashing down, but um, administrators and people that work with teachers and just in and of yourself, like think about this sort of this reach out comfort in kind of model and, um, and use it to help you so think who, who will help me? Who will I reach to? Wonderful, great advice for anyone, anyone, because we, while we are experiencing this in different ways and it's having an effect on us at different levels, we are going through this COVID-19 pandemic and we have the opportunity to really reach into those lessons learned and move forward in positive ways positive ways. Thank you so much, Dr. Barup and Dr. Rice. And thank you to Dr. Barber and Dr. Norton and to Rowe University for hosting this panel today and for the opportunity to bring these educational leaders uh, to the forefront as we move forward to reopening schools and reimagining schools in the 21-22 school year. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, and big my applause to, to everyone. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I just want to say, Michael, before I jump into my next Zoom meeting, <laughs> Um, and my dogs are whining in the background again. I want to thank you all so much I, from the bottom of our hearts at Toro. I think this is such an essential um, conversation to have. And I noticed there are some current teachers that we work with on the our audience members. And so I think it's been such a great conversation. And Superintendent Estrella Henderson, thank you, as always, for your continued partnership and support as we kind of uh, work on all these items together as a community. I was just going to say I want to add my thanks to the, the panelists and uh, to our able moderator who uh, so seamlessly woven uh, wove the questions that we came up from the audience with the, the ones that um, she's been hearing on the ground with the constituencies that uh, she works with. Uh, I know we do a lot of things with uh, the Solano County Board of Education and uh, uh, we always enjoy the opportunity to engage with them and uh, like I said it's my first opportunity to to uh, interact with Lizette, and I, I hope it's not my last. Uh, so um, as you'll note, we've got Dr. Hendricks here now as we're hitting the top of the hour again. I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, if you have any questions that are uh, medical related, Dr. Henderson or Dr. Hendricks, sorry, is, uh, our, as I mentioned, our newly appointed uh, Dean of co the College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, in addition to that, she is trained as a pediatrician. And I know that uh, she has done a number of these webinars uh, that we've had at Toro University over the, the, the past, I guess, year. Well, definitely the past uh, six to eight months since the vaccine has been available. Um, so if you have any questions for her, uh, Dr. Hendricks is available to uh, answer any that you might have. And uh, as I mentioned to our panelists and our moderator before, you're welcome to stay and join and, and add, for that matter, ask questions of Dr. Hendricks yourself. Uh, but uh, we know that everyone has busy schedules. So if you have to drop off, that's perfectly okay as well. And once again, thank you for your involvement today. All right, so if you do have questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat or put them into the, the Q&A and uh, we'll just wait and see if we have any here. Dr. Hendricks, we've got one there uh, from Dr. Schweitzer asking uh, any updates on the vaccine for those under 12. Yes, thank you. And thank you so much for having, giving me the opportunity to be here. It was wonderful to um, observe the panel. I thought this was really engaging and informative. So huge thank you to our speakers and everybody who put this together. Um, I am a pediatrician and um, as you mentioned, the new Dean of our College of Medicine um, and then also a mother and my children are under the age of 12. Uh, and so I have been following this very, very closely in both my professional and my personal life. Um, so the status for vaccines for those under 12 um, is still on hold. They are running the clinical trials for uh, individuals under the age of 12. Those clinical trials are ongoing. There have been a couple hiccups. They have paused the trials on a couple of occasions. They are restarted um, and continuing to run now. Uh, a few months ago when the trials first started, uh, Pfizer was saying that they were going to apply for the emergency authorization use of the vaccine, of the Pfizer vaccine for individuals between the ages of five and 12. They were hoping to apply for that that in September, um, which would then make it available to um, kids probably late September or October. Uh, now I I've heard Dr. Fauci has been estimating maybe it'll be closer to December or January. So um, we're all just continuing to watch and follow. The trial data has been really good. That's been coming out so far. They are looking safe and effective um, for children. Uh, and they're just continuing to do the broad scale trials to make sure that the, the vaccines are as safe as they can be before we roll them out to the public. We've got a question in the chat from uh, Julie. She's asking about uh, what protocol should K-12 classrooms be looking at in terms of ventilation, uh, distancing, both between teachers, the students themselves, as well as the teachers, uh, masks, shields, open windows. 
Yeah. So once again, as a mom and a pediatrician, this is something that I have also been following really closely uh, because I want to make sure that both my patients and my children are as safe as they can be because they can't be vaccinated yet, or especially because they can't be vaccinated yet. Um, The California Department of Public Health actually just published um, new guidelines recommendations. They published it August 2nd. Um, So really recently published uh, their guidelines for K through 12 um, and their recommendations. A lot of them come straight from the CDC, uh, and they are listening to the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations as well, um, which I find all very reassuring. Uh, They are encouraging um, masks, so masks for all indoor use, adults and children, regardless of vaccination status. Uh, They are saying that with the use of masks, uh, you don't have to worry as much about that physical distancing, and so they're not having physical distancing um, mandates but they are definitely encouraging increased (laughs) ventilation in classroom spaces. So any indoor spaces. Uh, Oh, thank you so much for putting that up there. Um, uh, So you can read through it. I actually found it really helpful um, and pretty decent guidelines in terms of individuals who can't for maybe developmental reasons or medical reasons, can't wear a mask. They're encouraging the use of a face shield with some sort of a, a drape down at the bottom so that the air isn't coming up through the bottom of the face shield. Um, yeah, so I think I think that summarizes the majority of what those recommendations were. Now, you mentioned earlier about the, the emergency use, uh, use authorization. And I know a question that I get asked a lot because I'm at a medical school, even though I have no medical training whatsoever, um, for my family and friends is, what does it mean when, like, <clears throat> We've heard that, you know, Pfizer and Moderna and some of the others are going to be applying for full authorization or whatever the proper term is. Um, what, what difference would that make between, say, now when that happens and, and what we have now? Uh, So a lot of it has to do with the amount of data that has been collected with Pfizer and Moderna and now J&J, we have millions of data points if we look at the number of people who have been immunized and um, the FDA is following very closely the outcomes, the VAERS reports, so any vaccine related um, illnesses or side effects that happen after the vaccine. So as soon as they have a, a lot of that data is a lot of what goes into when they change it from just emergency use authorization to just regular, this is just a vaccine that we have. And that's going to change the availability of the vaccine. Because we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, we have actually seen that the vaccine has been pretty readily available even under the emergency use authorization. Um, But usually that's one of the things that 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 really allows for once it gets the full um, FDA approval is then you're able to get the vaccine at any of the places where you would normally get vaccines like the flu vaccine but we've kind of already seen it with the covid really because we're in a a crisis right now thank you um oh another question from dr schweitzer um if as of right now if we still had the tier systems we would be in the purple tier based on the old model Um, which would have had schools closed, why is it safer to send our schools back to school now, even though that positivity rate is still high? That's an excellent question. And I don't know that I would say it's safer to send our children to school uh, right now, but I would say it's important to send our children to school right now. Uh, We have seen over the last year, the toll that it, and some of that was addressed even in today's presentation, but the toll that not being in school and being so physically distant and isolated and not having resources, uh, that's taken a huge huge toll on our learners, on children of all ages, and really all of our learners are teachers. Um, And so uh, there's actually quite a lot of data about the mental health impacts, uh, the social, the learning impacts that that has had. And so there's been a big push by a number of organizations, but the American Academy of Pediatrics, which I'm a part of, um, has been really strongly advocating the importance of in-person school, as long as it's safe 
So that means masking and good aeration and testing um, and all of those things that we can do to keep it safe. So I wouldn't say that it's safer to send our kids back to school now than it was say last year, um, but I would say we've realized how important it is. Uh, Mary actually has a question. Uh, uh, what about children who are afraid to go back to school because they don't want to get sick? How can we make them feel safe? Yeah, I, I understand that completely. Um, I think that is a very um, valid fear uh, and a very very common fear. And I think addressing you know, this entire pandemic has been traumatic, um, whether you've been impacted by COVID personally or not, in terms of you've actually gotten sick or somebody in your family's gotten sick, that fear that you could get sick and um, seeing people around you get really sick and maybe having some personal deaths in your life. Um, it, it's a very valid fear. And I think addressing that mental health component, the anxiety and the trauma, trauma around it is hugely important. Um, and then educating how the virus is spread and what the risk mitigation factors that we're using are. So that means, you know, this virus is spread through droplets, uh, which, you know, somebody will cough or spit a little little droplets from their mouth and nose into the air. And so how do we protect that is we put a mask on them, we put a mask on us, we do good hand washing anytime we're going to touch our, our faces, um, our food, anything like that, we eat in outdoor really well ventilated areas. Um, I think, you know, we're just really educating around how the virus is spread, and what steps are being taken to keep people safe. And then also, what happens if you do get sick. So if you do get sick, what are some of the, the potential outcomes? Um, I think the more knowledge that we can share, I think knowledge usually fights a lot of fear. I see Dr. Schweitzer had another um, question. Uh, as a follow-up, uh, what is the hospitalization and death rates for COVID for those under the age of 12? So those who still aren't of it eligible for the vaccine? Yeah, that is a great question and something that we are also following really closely. Um, the hospital is, and it, it, this is very um, variant depending on where in the country you are. So talking to my pediatric colleagues that are in different places uh, in the country, there are some children's hospitals that aren't very impacted with COVID at all. Those places tend to be places with higher vaccine rates um, and just lower spread, especially of the Delta variant. There are other places where the ICU is full of kids um, and relatively healthy kids. Whereas what we saw with the last waves, it was um, children that had underlying health conditions were mainly the ones that were getting sick from it. Um, so overall, the hospitalization and death rate for children under the age of 12 still tends to be lower than what we see in adults, but we are definitely seeing it. Okay, I'm just watching the chat. I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, I know that uh, and, and Dr. Schweitzer mentioned this to us directly. Um, there were some YouTube videos that you did with uh, uh, your kids on the virus that I went looking for quickly there, but I couldn't find them while you were talking. So uh, when we send out a copy of the recording, I'll try to include that at the bottom. Uh, so that way folks can have access to those since I wasn't able to, to pull them up on the fly. And I'm just trying to build a little time to see if the last five or six folks in the room have any additional questions. Um, but I'm not seeing anything come through the chat. So oh, another one from um, uh, Dr. Rice is one of the reasons for not wanting to do a booster shot, a concern about escalating the virus, sort of like antibiotics. So that is an excellent question. And no, um, the vaccine works in a very different way than antibiotics would. So like we, we aren't afraid that the virus is going to become resistant to the vaccine because there's so much vaccine available. Um, but actually, the more vaccinated individuals we have, the 
more we can dampen the spread, meaning the fewer people will get it, and then the less likely the virus will be able to um, replicate. Uh, what I saw, I think just reported today, is the World Health Organization is uh, suggesting that we there are already countries in the world, like India, who are already doing a booster vaccine, meaning a third vaccine, a third dose um, for the Pfizer vaccine, uh, because that has been shown to be protective, especially against the Delta and some of the other newer variants. Um, the World Health Organization just put out a report saying that they are recommending against put everybody pushing for a third vaccine because there are so many countries in the world that don't have any vaccine. So it would be much better to at least share the vaccine that we have. Um, so we have more individuals that at least have some immunity rather than hyper protecting different pockets. All right, I'm following along in the chat. I, I think we may be wound down on questions. I'll give it another minute here to, to see if anything new comes in the chat. I noticed that for those that are still remaining that uh, Dr. Schweitzer put in a link uh, that has a list of uh, free vaccine clinics that uh, don't require appointments. So if you are in need of your first or second shot, uh, the list of, of places that you can uh, just walk in and uh, get your shot is uh, there. And I know, and Dr. Hendricks, you might know the, the specifics on it, but I know that we are also still doing vaccine clinics, I think just about every weekend um, in different locations. And I don't know off the top of my head when the next one is, but you may. <laughs> we, we actually have a couple this weekend, um, multiple this weekend. I think they can be found in that link that Dr. Schweitzer provided. Uh, the pop-up clinics are fantastic. They're happening right in the community, right where the need is. And yes, absolutely. Anybody can come by. You don't need an appointment. You don't need to pay money. Uh, just come by and get vaccinated. And we often have multiple versions of the vaccine, meaning the Moderna or the Pfizer. So if you're needing a second dose um, of one of those, then we usually have those available. All right. Um, there, Dr. Schweitzer is letting us know that the, our pop-up clinics this weekend, uh, the Toro sponsored ones are all at the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District Schools. Um, but anyone in the county is welcome to come. And next weekend we are in, um, I don't remember if VC is Vallejo City. City. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure if it was Vallejo City or Vacaville. Um, but Vallejo City Unified uh, School District next weekend. Um, so, um, and again, on that website, you'd be able to get all access to all of the ones that we are doing in the community. So seeing no other questions, I'm gonna thank you, Dr. Hendricks for uh, sticking around uh, at the end of this session and providing this information. And uh, thank you to Dr. Schweitzer for the suggestion. Uh, that we add this to the event. Uh, I think as we've seen from some of the folks that have mentioned in the chat, they appreciated this opportunity. And uh, I will close it out there and thank everyone for attending.